This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. And boom. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. I am your humble host, John Allen. Before I get started with a very uh, exciting conversation, I want to tell everyone to please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube and remember to click that bell icon if you're a first time watcher or listener. Okay? You can also find me at johnallenpod.com. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into this conversation. Hi, Caroline Katsurubas. Hello, John. Hi. You are a um, illustrious representative of Freight Farms. Um, I I want to start off by telling my listeners, um, Freight Farms has been on my mind for a couple, three months now. A friend of mine told me about freight farms, and I'm not even going to try and, and, and wade through a description of freight farms. I'd like for you to just take the microphone, Caroline, and, and tell us what freight farms is all about. Sure. Thanks, John. So I think what we're most well known for is our container farms. So what we've done as a company is uh, designed and built these vertical hydroponic farms that are retrofit with inside inside uh 40 foot shipping containers um and they can pretty much go anywhere in the world to grow fresh local produce regardless of kind of what's going on outside so you can live in the middle of the desert uh, and be growing fresh local produce with very minimal water or you can be in you know northern canada in negative 30 degrees on an island a, on an on island, an island. In, in northern norway perhaps <laughs> yes perhaps that as well where there may be you know limited sunlight for for part of the year yeah it's it's a very interesting concept. I, I'm told, like I said, I'm totally fascinated by it. Can you tell my listeners what is hydroponic farming? What is it? Yeah, so hydroponic farming is basically a method of growing food without soil. So absolutely soilless operation, and uh, it's it's basically we're taking the nutrients which are typically housed in the soil and we're actually dissolving them into water and the way that our particular hydroponic system works is that it's a closed loop system which means it's constantly recirculating uh, which means it's very water efficient so we're using anywhere between zero and ten gallons of water per day which is sometimes close to yeah it's like upwards of 99, I know that sounds crazy, 99% less water than traditional farming. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, There's two things that fascinate me. The fact that it uses zero soil. So any issues with erosion, any issues with uh, potential byproducts uh, that, that could contaminate or wear out the soil system, you don't have to think about that. But it's also the fact that it uses so incredibly little water. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely mm-hmm. mind blowing. So, how how does this how does this work then with the nutrient? How do you, how do you infuse the nutrients with the product? Great question. So we have um, hydroponics has actually been a, around for quite some time. It's becoming a, a lot more popular now, and uh, so there are a variety of different ways that you can infuse the water with nutrients. Sometimes there's a liquid nutrient solution, which just simply you dose into the water, um, and you have to keep certain elements separate. So sometimes we house them in different tanks, uh, and then when it's time to actually dose the water, they both go in together. Otherwise, if they meet each other before the water, they sometimes uh, form a solid. So wow. there's liquid nutrients and then there's powdered nutrients as well. So it's it's all the things that you would find um, traditionally in the soil, like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium. Oh, I'm missing the two other major ones. Uh, what You know, so, soil things, science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What, what what kind of supply line can I, let's say I were to start this at my farm way up north on that lonely island in northern Norway? How would I? The, the supply line seems like that would be a challenge. You know, where would I get these nutrients that I need to 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 use? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, with, does the, in other words, does the company supply that, or am I kind do. of on my own? Okay, so I wouldn't be on so, my own. Right, you're you're definitely not on your own. Uh, we do, you know, we have a something that we called farmhand shop. So you can basically refill all of your supplies and your nutrients and your other kind of consumables. Um, but sometimes internationally, we find that challenging, actually, if it's shipping from the U.S. So because there are some rules and regulations. So we often will help our farmers source something more locally as well, okay. especially if we're shipping long distances. We want to make sure your costs are down and, sure. and you're running an effective business. Because I would imagine it's fairly basic. I mean, these are common nutrients. It's not like it's things that are exclusive to the United States. So Correct. freight farms would just help and Uh, an international user to find a local source. Exactly. Okay. Very interesting. Now, how, how long has hydroponic farming been around and when did freight farms first get involved with it? Mm -hmm. So hydroponics, I believe has been around for thousands of years. Like I don't quote me on this. It's terrible that we're recording, but you know, in, no, in okay. Babylon, um, there were hanging gardens and they would use this yeah. to to conserve water and make sure to to be able to grow certain types of food. So it's been a, a, around for quite some time, um, but it definitely had a little bit of a resurgence in the past few decades. I think there is typically some stigma around what you're growing when it comes to hydroponics. A lot of people assume... Also- they would assume you're growing marijuana, um, but uh, it's actually a method of, um, like we said, a very efficient method of growing fresh produce as well. So you can do it in both ways. Um, but Freight Farm started back around 2010, 2000, between 2010 and 2012 was kind of when the idea kind of took off. Okay. Um, yeah. You guys are fairly I, new, fairly new at it then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, our co-founders were working together here in Boston on this uh, rooftop greenhouse project. They were ah. going, yeah, so they were trying to help a local school build a, um, a garden on their rooftop. And they, you know, started digging around and realized that there are a lot of obstacles when it comes to building rooftop greenhouses in particular in Boston as well, where the infrastructure is, is quite old and in some places. So each, um, project would kind of have to be a custom retrofit and it takes a lot of time and money and knowledge too. So, uh, but they saw that it, it, uh, was a really big opportunity for urban agriculture to kind of emerge as a competitive industry within, within the food landscape. I see. Um, but a little bit inaccessible. So they wanted to create a product that was more modular and turnkey so that anyone could truly grow food wherever they are. So who is the typical client that comes to Freight Farms and says, hey, I or we want to get started with this? What does that person look like? Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would say about 60 to 70 percent of our customer base are actual individual entrepreneurs that are looking to get into farming or food production and start their own small business. So they can get started started with zero agricultural experience because we're going to provide that training for them. How do, and, let me interrupt you there. How, how does yeah. that uh, training uh, go? Is it uh, do, do they have to relocate for a certain amount of time to Boston or is this an online type of thing? Or do you send... Um, do you send teachers and instructors out to the people? All of the above, John. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Um, <laughs> I know. So we we used to uh, just host a two day farm camp. That's what we called it, farm camp, because we wanted it to sound, you know, fun. Um, yeah. A, a two-day farm camp here in Boston, but obviously that's kind of hard to scale, especially if people are kind of restricted by long distances. So we then expanded into more of an online, um, uh, like self-paced learning environment where you can oh. go and watch video tutorials and things. And then with COVID, it kind of brought everything to a halt from the in-person learning. So we uh, now do virtual Zoom trainings uh, for all of our farmers. And in some cases, we still do go out and help them launch um, on an individual basis. So it's it's mostly people looking at it from an entrepreneurial aspect. Yes. So So this is scalable. This is scalable then. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And it really depends on 
their their own mission and motivation to get started? Is it purely a side hustle and they're just kind of trying to make some spare cash? Maybe they'll run one or two farms, but if they're looking to make this their sole income, you know, sometimes three plus farms would be the best route to take. Uh, but we have, uh, because food, you know, is obviously something that is super important and crucial to sure. every single person's life. Um, we work with a lot of different folks. So we also work with schools who are looking to make more hands-on learning experiences for their students. I really wish I had one when I was in school. <laughs> um, yeah. And then hopefully those those people will graduate and actually become farmers. And I feel like when you're in school, it's not necessarily a profession that is talked about as like a viable option for someone to go into. So we've actually had um, a, a couple students who have graduated who worked on a freight farm at their school graduate to become freight farmers um, in their own capacity, which is incredible. Interesting. And, yeah. And then the other, I would say the other big group for us is a nonprofit or more mission-based organizations who are implementing okay. this in a variety of different ways that I don't think people uh, kind of think farming can be applied in this way, whether that's, you know, job training programs or therapeutic work environments. Um, mm. Yeah. D different educational platforms and initiatives is truly incredible. Different social groups, maybe community uh, outreach programs. I, I could see that being a good thing in some inner city areas, getting the people involved with sustaining their own nutritional needs, which is a problem in a lot of urban areas. Mm -hmm. I also think about the, um, you know, there's a there's a pretty there's a few big uh, agricultural schools in Scandinavia, but specifically here in Norway. And I've just had the, ever since I first found out about this, I've thought of a couple of things. I've thought of how can I do this and how can the word be spread uh, throughout here, throughout Norway. And I thought right away about the agricultural schools in Norway, um, yeah. to say the least, you know, if, if not in all of Scandinavia, but specifically here in Norway. Um, I'm not so sure that this is something they're teaching, but I'm very sure that it's something that they should be teaching because it's so, it's so efficient. Um, the, the ecological footprint is not damaging at all. It's quite the opposite. It's, it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The agricultural schools or even the, um, vocational schools, any type of, uh, like, K to 12 school that's teaching more uh, technical skills. Mm -hmm. This is a great, great way to introduce a, a new type of uh, farming. And we do work with quite a few universities and schools within the US um, that have integrated this into their curriculum and are definitely expanding the variety of uh, agricultural methods that they're exposing their their students to um which is which is great you know uc davis which is i think the leading agricultural school i want to say in the world or in the country i can't get that let's wrong say the world let's, let's say the world it sounds it sounds let's better the world. <laughs> it is um and and they're uh running a lot of research and educational programs with our farms as well and then um Auburn University here in the U.S. as well. Just they're they're doing something called and they're building out their transformational garden. I believe is what they're referring it to, uh, referring to it as. And they have two of our farms, and they also have outdoor soil based farming methods as oh, wow. well. So yeah. it's it's really a piece of the puzzle. We're not trying to solve every single thing, but container farming and vertical farming definitely has its place. I was going to say, I think it, it doesn't solve everything, but it certainly solves a lot. Um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, desert areas in the United States or worldwide. Uh, it, there's some enormous challenges to, uh, to supplying them with, with fresh fruits and vegetables. This solves that problem. I'm thinking of, um, it's a problem to a lesser degree, but it is an issue. Um, again, I keep referring to our place up in Northern Norway, where we have an, uh, it's on an island and we have a farm up there. And it is a challenge to get fresh vegetables. I mean, you can get them, but how fresh are they going to be? And I just have this vision of having uh, a shipping container using the freight farms concept and supplying that region, those people, you know, those friends and family members of ours mm -hmm. with yeah. fresh vegetables. 
and it'll change their the concept of fresh vegetables that they have because it's it's far from fresh what they're getting mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the idea that it's that it's doable. I mean, it's not. Um, I, I guess some big corporation could implement this concept and have you know dozens, maybe hundreds of farms uh, using your concept. I guess they could do that. But the idea that it's it can start with that individual entrepreneur. Uh, let's not even use that word entrepreneur, just that individual. It might be someone who just wants to have some fun and maybe start a new new hobby or they want to feel more engaged in protecting the environment. So that, that it can start at that level by just an average guy or, or lady. Mm-hmm. It, it's, 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 I, I don't know. I like it. I'm on fire for it. I love it. I yeah, just love me it. Me too. Me too. They, re- they really inspire me because they all t- like starting a, a new thing, a new business, a new side hustle is intimidating and scary. And sure, a lot of people sure. don't actually take the leap, but uh, the people that we work with really, uh, they're so passionate and each of them have different motivations for starting, right? They could be, have, have been affected by um, food in their area or have uh, someone in their life that just inspired them. And then they, they get started and they have yeah. uh, really creative solutions to solving complex problems in their area. What kind of funds does the individual have to have? They just want to, they just want to start with one container. Okay. They want to start at that level. What kind of funding does that person need? Yeah. So right now our, our greenery farm, that's the name of our container farm costs $139,000 to, to purchase. And then there are other costs associated with getting started, which is making sure you actually have the right site for it to go. So there might be some costs if you're, you know, excavating a plot of land or uh, things like that. So you can budget anywhere between maybe 500 and a couple of thousand for site preparation and then shipping as well. And yeah, then, let me, let me, let me back, your- let me back up just a minute. Um, uh, two questions, shipping of what and um, uh, what kind of shipping container are we talking about? Yeah. So two yes. questions there. Yes, shipping of the actual farm. So we manufacture all of our farms here in uh, the U.S. So you're going to actually, it's particularly between Massachusetts and Vermont. So you're going to be shipping um, your farm from here, which we help with cover the logistics uh, and any coordination for you, unless you want to do it yourself, of course. And then I forget the second part of that question already. Um, cost. What, it was cost. Oh, yeah, yeah, but what, what type of shipping container are oh, we talking about? Is it shipping is, container? Yeah. yeah. So we actually have uh, started to build our own specialty containers from the ground oh, really? up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which we didn't used to do. We actually used to use upcycled shipping containers. Oh. Uh, I would say up until about 2019. And that was great because obviously you're repurposing something. Uh, But we found that in order to achieve the true climate controls within our system, we needed to build our own specialty. I would imagine that the cost of refurbishing a basic shipping container could be, things would probably be more efficient if you just designed your own uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, with this, with the exactly. specs, with the specs that you need from the get go. Yeah. yeah, it was creating too many kind of inconsistencies. Um, and when you're trying to make one particular modular product, you need to have that right. um, across the board. Right. Now, uh, now let me see if I can remember the numbers that I read on your website. Um, a forty square meter container does the farming as if you were on. Was it 10 acres of, of land? So Am it's I remembering closer that right? to, to about two and a half acres of annual food production. Two within, and a half, okay. Yep, within about 320 square feet. We're on a different metric system. <laughs> yes. <laughs> feet, inches, meters, centimeters. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah. So that was that's me then uh, doing the wrong calculations. You know, I've, I've lived in Norway for almost 19 years now. And wow. Yeah. And even though I still think in feet and inches, it's not, it it should be easy for me to do that conversion, but I'm, 
consistently off on my conversions. So I was just honestly working on a document where I was converting all of the U S metrics, uh, into the Imperial. And I was just like this, why can't we all be speaking the same language? It would make things considerably easier. And, you know, and, and uh, I have to say after all this time of living in Norway, I think it's the U S that needs to get in line with Europe. I would say so too. Yeah. Because it really, it really is easier. Everything is just decimals here. It's mm -hmm. so much simpler. It, you know, why, why is a foot 12 inches? You know, what is, what's, what's that all about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Anyway, I digress. I digress. So now, <clears throat> okay. So this is scalable. People are doing it in the United States. Um, I live overseas. What kind of support, what kind of help with, um, what kind of help could I expect to get from freight farms being that I live in a totally different country, in a totally different continent? Mm -hmm. And a different time zone. And a well. different time zone. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we, we do have a amazing client services team that is available for technical support over the phone or email. Um, and then the other resources that we have been putting together as a company, we have online knowledge base. So if you have anything kind of going on, you go in and search your problem and you'll come up with an article, um, article or two or a video to help you kind of, uh, troubleshoot on your own. And then the other pretty amazing resource that you're able to plug into is our freight farmer community as well. So they ah. actually act as this extended network of support. Sure. So if you happen to be experiencing something, um, you know, over the weekend where unfortunately right now we don't necessarily have the capabilities to extend over, over the weekend to always be available. Uh, you have, you have them to fall back on you can go into your forum and actually ask a question and, or, or, you know, search, um, our online resources as well. Okay. Interesting. Um, tell me a little bit about the practical applications, you know, um, uh, boots on the ground, uh, gloves on the hands, you're getting started in this. How much time can one expect to have to use, I don't know, per day, per week, per month? Uh, and how long does it take from the first seed to the first harvest? Mm -hmm. So once you're kind of up and running and really familiar with the system, you've kind of gone over that learning curve, you can expect anywhere between 15 to 20 hours a week to operate one of the farms. That's all. And that, that's all. One, that's one, really per, all. one person. One person. Yeah. Wow. For one farm. Yeah. And uh, in the beginning, it might be a little bit higher, maybe 25, 30 hours. But once you reach that level of comfort. Yeah. You know, you obviously want to be spending a, a bit more time in there in the beginning as you familiarize yourself with everything. But yeah, it's, it's it's not too it's not too bad, and it's actually a great environment to be spending your time. So you can oh, yeah. you know break break it up however you want. Ultimately, you're in control. That is really surprising that it doesn't take more time than I was thinking. You know, at least forty hours, maybe a sixty hour work week. You know, a, a lot of work, a lot of stress, but no, okay. 15, yeah, 20, 20 hours, hours. Yeah. 15, 20 hours to operate the farm. If you're running a business, obviously you want to be spending that other time making sure that you are developing your sales channels, um, planning your harvests, yeah. any other kind of more administrative business tasks will be separate from those 15 okay. to 20 hours. So let's say I'm going to do, um, heads of lettuce. Um, how does the, um, how does the time for the, uh, for the, for the, for the plants to mature, how does that compare to traditional farming? Is it a mm -hmm. shorter gestation time or is it longer? So it's actually exactly the way the plant would okay. want to perform outside in the perfect condition. So okay. from seed yeah. through harvest, you can expect a head of lettuce in about six weeks from when you actually plant the seed. So they'll spend two to three weeks in our nursery propagation area until they reach a certain maturity. And then they're transplanted into the true vertical towers in the system where they'll stay for another couple weeks until they're ready for harvest. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and then on say like a, a weekly basis, you are going to be harvesting upwards of about a thousand heads of lettuce every single week, pretty consistently. Um, 
and you asked if it was faster than the outside. So the way that I like to explain this is inside the farm, you're getting the perfect, perfect day every yeah. single day. So if you're climate living control in the perfect, and everything, climate and controlled, yeah. it's the perfect amount of sunlight, the perfect amount of CO2, uh, the perfect temperatures. If you think about outside, that's, that's not always the case unless you live in you know, some areas, but yeah. even those areas experience fluctuation. Sure. You have cloudy days, you have rainy days. Sometimes you even experience like blight, drought, pests, yeah. anything. So, so maybe I can dare to say that it would possibly uh, be a shorter time through, through the freight farm system because everything is so perfectly controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could you could say, could that. say that, and then and then yeah. we do we do have farmers. I was just talking to one yesterday that is kind of pushing his farm to the max to make sure he is getting as many heads of lettuce as fast as possible. So he can actually go in and, and tweak his the elements within his farm. So like like more moisture, more light, things like that. More is that what you light, mean? Light, yeah. um, making sure that the nutrients are always like in pristine condition, maybe turning things over a little bit faster. Yeah. Okay. There are a couple different variables that you can. So he's looking for maximum profitability then. Exactly. He is. Interesting. Yeah. He, he uh, kind of stepped away from a really intensive career uh, in the tech startup um, world running, you know, different types of businesses. He was building a family at the same time and ultimately wanted to spend more time with them and uh, looked to get to get started with more of a home-based business. So he currently has three of our farms and three, um, yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. How, how big of a property does he have? I'm just trying to um, visualize three, three of these containers, <clears throat> 40 so square he, feet. Yeah. He's on Long Island. Uh, ah. So he has a bit of a, a plot of land out there. Not too big. I'm actually, I'm not totally sure uh, how the size of it, but enough to fit the three containers and they're, they're spaced out just a little bit. Okay. Well, it, it seems like that would be the perfect home based business. I mean, you're, you're, you're right there, you're on your property and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound easier than it is, but again, I'm, 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 quite surprised that it only demands roughly 20 hours, uh, give or take. Um, it, 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 it just, it seems like you could have quite the life, mm -hmm. quite the home life, quite the family life and, uh, time to do other things, time to perfect your distribution channels, for example. Um, wow. So when can I start? <laughs> <laughs> I have that. I ask myself that question like every day. <laughs> what, what is your job at Freight Farms? What exactly uh, do you do? How would you describe your work there? It's a great question. So I sit technically on the marketing team, but I have the pleasure of working with um, a lot of the different departments within the company, obviously the sales team and then the client services and product team as well. Um, we... Our, our job on the marketing team and, and what I take very seriously is just educating everyone on the potential to do this, the impact that it can have on the, the environment, on your food source, on food security, nutrition, sustainability, all of that. Um, and then the, the other amazing part of my job is I just get to talk to our customers and help spread their, their stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just, um, I don't know. I, I love what I do. It's great. I bet you do. I bet you do. Now, okay, help, let, let's spread a story here. Um, think for a second. Think of the one client, or, or maybe there's a couple of them. Uh, the couple, just pick, pick a person from the Freight Farms family and tell us what they have experienced. Maybe what kind of a background that person has uh, before starting with Freight Farms. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, um, they were doing something that had absolutely nothing to do with farming, no kind of personal private business before they were just an average Joe, you know, I want, I want, I want to, maybe you can tell a story that will inspire somebody to, to, to kind of, you know, take that step to cross that line. Maybe there's somebody who's on the fence thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. What kind of a story, what kind of a real life story can you tell to push that person over the edge? Here's a challenge for you. It is a challenge because <laughs> on there the spot. are so Shame many. On me. Shame on me. Oh, 
putting you on the spot. <laughs> I know. So maybe I can tell a couple of stories, but the first sure. one that always kind of comes to my mind is our customer in Indianapolis. His name is Mario Vitalis. And I had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time, actually at one of our open houses in Miami, Florida. So we were going uh, to another one of our customers who um, is a an amazing organization that is tackling um, kind of resources and residents for women and children experiencing homelessness. So mm. they have a freight farm on their site. Oh, see, I, I started with one and I'm already going to <laughs> I another. I love it. I love it's, it. <laughs> okay. So I'll tell both of these stories because okay. they're, yeah. they're super impactful. So Lotus House is the organization that I'm referring to and they're in Miami and they have a farm on site and they have created this, um, pretty incredible educational program for the children and women in residence at their shelter. And I hate to say shelter because it's so much more than a shelter. It's truly a uh, sanctuary for, for women and children experiencing homelessness. And they have their, the kids and the youth at the center um, can go in and learn all about uh, the plant life cycles and they're actually experiencing growing their own food. And, um, suddenly they have a much bigger interest in eating kale or other leafy greens than maybe they, they would otherwise, cause they actually grew it. And all of that food is going directly into the culinary center at, yeah. um, at Lotus House, which is amazing. So these women and children are getting the freshest, most hyper local produce uh, in in right in their uh, cafeteria that's grown on site. So anyway, they helped us host an open house back in 2019. Um, it's basically just a space for other potential freight farmers to come and meet our team and see the system in person because you know. Who wants to buy a hundred and forty thousand dollar product without actually seeing it and talking to other people? Right. So that's that's a huge part of my job as well is making sure people have access to the information. So we all gathered there, and Mario came to to Miami, um, and he ultimately decided right then and there he's gonna gonna purchase this. And a little bit about Mario, he. Um, He's had a lot of experience within the corporate world. Um, and then he he started to branch out into those more entrepreneurial activities, looking for a way to be his own boss and kind of reclaim his, his own narrative. Um, ultimately, he started with uh, running Airbnbs on some properties that he owned in Indianapolis. And then there was another vacant lot um, and he really kind of had this calling to get back into agriculture because there was a longstanding history within his family. Um, you know, his his uh, great great I, I don't know how many greats were were actually slaves in the South, and then they um, his family were also sharecroppers, uh. and. They, they so he's got, talking about changing, you know, taking a step towards a new future for his family. Yeah, plain exactly. and simple. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, going going back to the land on his own terms, and uh, especially with land ownership being such a, a hard thing, and also just traditional agriculture requiring so much upfront knowledge with um, uh, things like that. So this is this is a, a way for him to take ownership over at least a container farm yeah. and, and get growing, um, on his own terms. Let, let me just interrupt for a second. What's his name? Mario Vitalis. Mario yep. Vitalis. Okay. Now he is, he, he spoke about his great grandparents being slaves. He spoke about, uh, the years of sharecropping and, and all of that. How did he then get into a position where, you know, you know, $140,000 is not, it's not a fortune, but it's not a small amount of money either. So can you go a little bit more into his backstory about how he got to that point to mm -hmm. where he could actually invest in this? I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because it is a very pertinent topic for 
all of our farmers as well. How do you access the the financial capital to actually get going? Mm-hmm. And there are a variety of different, you know, loans or, or um, uh, funding ways, but a lot of uh, our farmers choose to go through the USDA um, loans as well. So he applied for a loan, was ultimately denied his, his loan, uh, <sighs> which he... Right. Good, good, good. (laughs) Um, And he ultimately decided to fight it. He went to um, appeal the decision. And one of our team members also kind of sat in on that appeal to provide additional support from the freight farms team because I just love you guys to death. I just have to interrupt again that you guys would do that, that you would step in to support him, step in on his behalf. That is that doesn't happen often enough. You know, I've, I've had a lot of different guests and about a lot of different subjects. And some of those subjects have to do with, uh, let's call it social issues. And that little piece right there has made me fall even more in love with freight farms that you guys would do something like that. I just had to say that. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And, um, so I, I believe he was denied, ultimately because they they felt he either didn't have enough experience within the agriculture sector and his numbers and his business plan didn't they they didn't think it was actually viable so how did you guys what kind of help did you guys then come with to push him over the edge and get approval so we have to the other thing that i would love to say yeah. about this whole process and and sometimes i hope that the reasoning behind the denial is related more towards the lack of education around vertical farming and the potential it can have because, you know, the USDA is more used to working with traditional soil based farms and they understand, you know, the production of land, how many harvests something can have. But when it comes to vertical farming, they're like, "Mm, I don't get it. So sometimes there's that lack of education, but we all know that that's not the only it's not the only reason. Um, so we come uh, well equipped with the capabilities of our technology and then the business plan as well. So let me, let me, let me back up. Let me back up just a minute. Are we alluding to the fact that it's because Mario is a black man that that could have played a part in him being denied? I, I don't want to speak for him no, by any means. No. Um, but do, does that happen very frequently? Yes, it yeah. does. Um, yeah. there, there's a longstanding history of, of that happening, obviously. Uh, loan discrimination um, within, you know, every kind of institution within the United States in particular. That is an issue. Also, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I've spoken yeah. about that quite a bit on uh, on my podcast, on other on other episodes. And uh, unfortunately, that is a, that <laughs> that is a problem. Mm-hmm. That is a problem. Absolutely. And I, one, I, of, one of Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Um, one of the the other things just on on the topic of kind of race and equality and access. Um, the other thing that, you know, over the past year as a company, we've been doing a lot of reflecting um, and and obser- observing, I, I would say. Uh, a lot of our, you know, in, in the U.S., there aren't many black farmers. And no. that's due to many, many reasons of, you know, lack of, um, land access, but also yeah. land theft. Uh, yeah. and you know, when we look at our customer base and the demographics of our customer base, and we notice that there aren't, uh, as many representation through the BIPOC communities, you know, it, yes. it leads us to ask the question, why, why is that the case? Um, what have you come up with as far as an answer? It is a tangled, tangled web that we weave, but a lot of it does have to do with, you know, the longstanding history of disenfranchisement. Ooh, that's a long yeah. word that sometimes I struggle with and uh, access to capital and just, you know, predatory practices in general. Um, so when Mario signed on, he was talking to us and he was like, I want more black farmers doing this. And he has been an incredible reference in general for us as a, as a company. Cause he speaks to so many, you know, future farmers yeah. and, and gets them started. But ultimately I feel like he is a, 
um, a role model for, for other black farmers that are looking to get into this and can help inspire, um, inspire more change. I can tell you, I made sure I wrote down his name. I'm going to get in touch with him. Maybe you can help me do that. I this can is absolutely a guy, help you get in touch with him. This is a guy who is a perfect, uh, he would be the perfect guest for my podcast. I am extremely curious about him. Oh, great. Um, I'm so excited. I'm so yeah. excited. Cause he, I think when we first talked, John, I was saying that m- one of my favorite parts of my job is obviously talking to farmers yeah, and I, and that, yeah. you know, they, they fill my cup. They really yeah. inspire me. Um, and Mario is absolutely one of those people. He is considering all of the things that he has faced within his, um, kind of journey to becoming a freight farmer, numerous obstacles. He is so positive and enthusiastic and will like run directly at any challenge that yeah. he has faced. And how old is he? Oh gosh. I don't want to draw any, I'm <laughs> maybe late thirties, early forties. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mario, yeah. if you're listening, I'm so sorry if that was <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Mario. Hey, I'm 21. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) He does have a couple of kids. So that's why I'm leaning more towards late thirties, early forties. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you guys stepped in and tell me Mm -hmm. again, what, what, what did you guys do? What did you feel you had to do? What were you able to do in order to help him get approved for the, for the USDA loan? Yeah, we have to validate the technology okay. and the business opportunity there um, and, and make sure, you know, the numbers, we stand behind them. So you They've guys had been, to erase, you had to erase the mystery, in other words. You had to exactly. tell, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and the cool thing about what Mario did, and he can he can tell you this when he talks to you as well, he the original loan, I believe, was for $50,000, and he was denied. And then they overturned the denial, and he was like, yeah, you're going to give me $200,000 now so I can get multiple farms. Uh, so, and and that's what they it. did. That's what they did. And, and so what did he end up getting? Um, he got three? Two. Two, two. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So Mario's in Indianapolis with two. And then the other person that I was talking about is in Long Island with three. So Mario is in Indianapolis. Is he like right smack in the, in the city or is he on the edges? You know, I'm just, I'm thinking about placement and, and land and, and, and whatnot. I believe he is in the city, but it's more of like a, a neighborhood, like a okay. s- yeah. suburban neighborhood yeah. in Indianapolis, yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, I watch, um, I've been watching a lot of reality TV and, uh, that show, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's the, it's the two redheaded ladies, the mother and the daughter, and they rehab houses in Indianapolis. And it seems to be, and I can remember also during my time as a truck driver going into Indianapolis. And I thought it was a little bit different as far as big cities go in that when you, get out of the downtown area, which isn't that big, but when you get into the neighborhoods, you feel like you're in the suburbs. Mm, so yeah, mm-hmm. so I could picture, so I could picture Mario having, yeah, more than enough room to have a couple of, couple of freight farms. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Boy, I'm going to talk to this guy. Uh, I can't wait. Now, how long, how long has he been doing this? He has been doing this since I think early 2020. Yeah. Oh, so he's real mm-hmm. fresh at it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that mm-hmm. right there, you know, and I asked you to tell me a story or two that would inspire people to get in, involved in this. And that story inspires. Here is a guy who, after generations of, of uh, if not poverty, generations of, of extreme difficulty and disenfranchisement. Uh, and here he has... Uh, did I just say that word wrong? Disenfranchisement. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my fault. <laughs> no, forgive me. I've been in Norway too long. So, <laughs> um, no, but after after generations of that to now uh, get his feet wet in the business world and then in this type of business through the help of you guys, I... Can I love you guys more than I do? I, I don't. I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> it's our farmers that that make us so lovable. It's ultimately what they're doing. It's real that, people. It's real it's people real doing people. things that they have a passion for. Yep. Yeah. It is. 
So you are probably very satisfied with your job. You I am. <laughs> you couldn't Unless imagine. Unless I become a farmer. That's the, that's the un, only other alternative. Well, well that was what I was going to get to. How, how prevalent is it within the freight farms um, uh, employee, employee uh, uh, mass for them to actually do this? It's because, funny that you- yeah, because I'm thinking this is a new company, which means a relatively new company, which means there's a lot of work to do, which means you guys are probably putting in the hours at the at you know at the desk, on the phone, in the meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have a very dedicated bunch. Um, I can imagine at, on the team. Yeah, and I've been with the company for going on eight years, and. The question that I get most frequently when people hear that is what has kept you there for so long? Tell me. And it, you know, it's everything that we've already talked about, yeah. right? The farmers that really fill my cup, but it is m- my teammates ultimately also. Um, they are so smart and so passionate um, that they, they challenge you every single day and kind of inspire you to keep going. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a hustle environment. Um, and you can't, you can't really slow down because when you slow down, you notice everyone's whizzing right by you and you're like, I need to, but you get tired. You get tired. Don't you? I do. I do. (laughs) I think everyone does, uh, especially this year, but uh, you know, now you say a, you, a healthy, healthy dose of play in there too. And having the sure, farm at yeah. our office is great because yeah. at least before COVID, you know, when you needed a little bit of a break and yeah. to step away from your desk, going in there to help, um, our, our actual on staff farmer was incredible because it's this, you step away from the screen and you're, you're mm-hmm. working with your hands. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of stimulating a different part of your brain. A lot of businesses will have like a, a, a massage chair in the office and you guys have, a, we have a farm. A, a, there you go. You have a farm. Mm-hmm. Now your, your farm there on site, I would imagine that it is used to pro- possibly um, try out new methods, try out new products and whatnot. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, we do a lot of research and development in our HQ farm. So we grow different types of crops, um, experimenting. <laughs> I just have to laugh for a second because here's, here's an example of that, that I've been in Norway for, I don't want to say too long, but for a long time, I was just about to ask you what, what is an HQ farm? But of course, HQ headquarters. headquarters. See, I, <laughs> Oh my sometimes, gosh! I feel yeah. like a foreigner sometimes about uh, all things American. I've been here don't a long feel time. Bad. I honestly don't know how common <laughs> that is in someone's vernacular. It's just what we call our farm, the HQ. Yeah, but farm. I'm a I'm a former uh, military man, former cop. I should oh, know what HQ. Should know I should HQ know what eight. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I need a vacation. I need to come home on vacation. Yes, you do, and you have to come visit us as well. Um, but yeah, we we do a lot of experimentation within our farm. So we uh, it's often where we're trying trialing different lights, different, um, different seeds, different watering techniques, different, uh, we just tweak, tweak a lot of different things. And sometimes we will even, uh, if a client is, you know, curious about the viability of a particular crop, we will try and grow it for them before they, uh, pull the trigger to see if, see if it's possible. So that happened, um, two years or so ago with, a uh, cosmetic beauty company. Um, they have a, a a flower that is actually like a very common ingredient in one of their you know products. Ah. So and it's called calendula is the flower. It's kind of in the family of marigolds. And we experimented and grew an entire farm of calendula. So wow. it, it was wild. It, it and calendula for those of you listening is like a very bright orange and bright yellow okay. so imagine walking into this metal box and just being <laughs> surrounded by bright orange and yellow flowers and it smells so good in there it's it, it's the juxtaposition between the technology and something so like bright natural and beautiful is is pretty incredible to see and i keep visualizing regardless of the crop but 
I just keep visualizing how pleasant of a job it must be if that's all you do, if all you're doing is freight farming and you're in mm-hmm. that environment for 20 some odd hours a week. You wait till you talk to Mario because Mario <sighs> has tricked out the inside of his farm oh. too. He's got like leather chairs in there. He's got a flat screen on the wall. It's clearly so he's his, hanging out in there. He's not he's just working hanging out. Right. Mario, yeah. Mario, I Mario. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know. It's great. I, you know, I have to, I, I, I do want to speak with Mario and, and, and preferably yesterday. <laughs> so when we're finished here, if you can help me get it's in my, touch with first, him. It's the first thing I'll do. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, now we're talking most, or I'm thinking mostly about vegetables, but a thought just fell into my head, uh, when you mentioned flowers, what about fruit? It's a good question. So yes, fruit can grow. Um, it's a question that we get all the time. People ask about so strawberries. I could grow, so I could grow pineapples, for example, Ooh. up in, or well, okay, let's Ooh. say, um, oranges. I could grow oranges Ooh. way up. Let's, let's, we're gonna we're gonna retract just a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. Yep. No trees. No trees yet. Okay. Um, and okay. pineapples also for I did not know what pineapples looked like until I was uh growing, until I was in Costa Rica on a, a farm ah. there. So you have to look up how pineapples are grown. They're okay. pretty incredible. So let me let me backtrack a little bit okay. for you. So yep. fruits. What types of fruits would be viable? Um, let's think like strawberries, tomatoes, cucumbers, they, more like vine crops, less trees. Gotcha. And, and okay. I also want, I'm going to throw in another caveat there as well. For our farmers that are operating this as a business, sometimes crops like that actually aren't the most economically viable oh. thing to be growing because it takes so long to actually grow the stem and the I vine see. And I then see. you're 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 putting all of your light energy and your resources into growing that vine versus, um, you know, the actual food. Ahead of, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then yeah. a head of lettuce, you can consume the whole thing. Right. Um, okay. So it's a little bit more high turn, um, smaller see. compact crops that are most economically viable. And then if you were going to get into to more of a tree or bush type of uh, producing product, uh, then you're probably looking at different dimensions of the container. Because again, we're talking 40 square feet. Or, or do you have other dimensions? We Currently, we just do the, the 40 foot container. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. No trees yet. No pineapples, no oranges. Oh, well. <laughs> I, know. I know. One day. One day. One day. Well, uh, you know, and, and why not? I mean, you guys are, you, you, you're constantly doing research and development, uh, and pretty soon somebody's going to come with some sort of a demand that challenges you guys to meet that demand, and then boom, all of mm-hmm. a sudden, all of a sudden, there you are. Exactly. I don't know. I think positive. I think yes. positive. Yeah. One I'm, day, I'm, your cheer, one day. I'm your cheerleader today. It's going to happen. It. One day. One day. <laughs> Another swallow of coffee. Um <laughs> Uh, what did you do before you started working with freight farms? If yeah, I may so, ask. Sure. Um, so before freight farms, I was actually just getting my undergraduate degree here in Boston at Northeastern. You're from Boston? I am born and raised. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the great thing about Northeastern is that you do internship programs throughout your entire kind of oh. career at the school. So okay. I worked, um, at the Environmental Health Fund. Uh, it's a nonprofit focusing on, you know, environmental issues. I worked at the non, uh, National Park Service, um, the Student Conservation Association, and then this like amazing other nonprofit called Lyft here in Boston, which is actually a national company as well. But yeah, little little bit of uh, experience here and there, but passionate about food and people, and that's ultimately what led Near me and dear to, to your heart. It is, yeah. yeah. I love food. <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think now about, like I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit selfish for having you on because I, I personally am very interested in uh, freight, freight farms. Um, if, I, let, let's say I was in a situation, let, let's say we have, um, let's say we have Mario 
here in Norway. And then he applies for some sort of government assistance to, to, to start this. And they turn him down. How then would freight farms be able to, su- to support someone here in Norway or maybe it's someone in Germany or someone in, uh, in, in Great Britain? How would you guys be able to support them in that capacity, that quasi-legal capacity? Is that doable? Um, I'm trying to I, sell. I'm trying to sell you guys to to the people of Norway here. I know. Yeah. Well, I assume what what we do in our sales process, we have an incredible sales team. And I know it's, you know when you hear the word sales team, you automatically think someone's trying to to kind of sell you on something, and and they'll pretty much do anything to get you over the line. But with our sales team, is I like to call them like guides. They are here to help you through the entire, um, at least up until you purchased your process to actually get your farm. So if you are experiencing obstacles, our team will ultimately tell the rest of the team and we will figure out a way to support you. So you guys Um, are oriented on that positive outcome regardless, and you will help in whatever way you can to make that happen. Yeah. And I mean, all, like that's what we've always done because our our product and our method of growing is so new that the people who are trying to buy these ultimately are going to become educators and they need assistance from us um, to help convince others. And if anything, that's what we're experts in because over yeah. the past 10 years or so, we've been told no, 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 no. Yeah, like yeah. it's not possible. Like you're <sighs> this, this just isn't going to be a thing. And now it finally is. And we just have to, um, be stronger in our efforts to remove those barriers to entry for, for people. I love it. I love it. You know, and, and you mentioned a lot of people, they might have that negative reaction when you, when you talk about, uh, or when you mention the word sales team or salesperson. Um, but I can, I can imagine that your, your goal is to make people as comfortable as possible. And your goal is to give that support. And I think the way you lay this out here, using the word sales team is, is it makes me feel empowered. If I were to be in on this, I have a sales team behind me. Not a sales team trying to push me into something, but a sales Mm -hmm. team trying to lead me towards my solution to make this happen. Exactly. And, um, you know, the sales team and your account executive that you're working directly with on your project, it's not just them. Um, Often, you know, our CEO or our CTO or any other kind of member of our team will come in to support the process. Um, so they, they're not even, just locked away in an office somewhere. They're, they're kind of hands they're, on. They're rolling up their sleeves yeah. and they are very hands on, which is great. And the other um, amazing kind of part of the process is we try to actually introduce you to other farmers that are doing it to yeah. answer, answer those questions and kick the tires and kind of pull yeah. back the curtain um, because it, it's ultimately a big investment and a, and a lifestyle change. So you want to make sure that the, the people that are at the company really have your back and, and we're coming from a, a genuine, authentic place um, of wanting to make the world a more sustainable um, place. So, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a great. big family of like-minded people from the top mm-hmm. down, it sounds like. Yeah. It is. Well, I, like I said, I'm on fire for this. I'm, uh, yeah, a lot of selfish motivation, I guess, to have this podcast episode. I wanted to learn, but then, but that's what my podcast is all about. I think I told you that I bring on people who, who, who interest me, who motivate me, who inspire me, people who I think I can learn something from. And you and freight farms fall into all three of those, uh, categories. Um, I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's, yeah. I'm sorry, happy to share, happy to share the information, happy to be here to talk to you. Um, very excited to, to potentially help, uh, activate some more farmers in, in Norway. Yeah. Um, because there's know, a place it, for it. Definitely. There's uh, definitely a place for uh, it. Especially up North. Again, that, that mm-hmm. access to, to fresh fruit, um, sorry, fresh vegetables is just not, uh, 
it's just not in place. It's not the way it should be. And that's just because of the distance. Mm-hmm. So if we, if you could have this concept in place, you know, locally, re- regionally, even, uh, it would make a huge difference in, in, in the, the type of produce that's available to people. So, I mean, you guys have the perfect, perfect concept, the perfect thing to implement to solve that problem. You guys are solving a, a, a serious problem. Yeah. We're empowering other people to solve the problem. Go Mario. <laughs> Go Mario. <laughs> I can't wait to talk to that guy. Okay. Um, but anyway, the here and now, I have really enjoyed speaking with you here today. Um, I feel uh, so much more the wiser for all things freight farms. Um, what can I say? Thank you for taking the time to do this. You have so much to do and you have so much responsibility and it has been an honor to have you on to talk about this. So thank you so much. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. You'll come back again if I ask you? Of course. And, you know, once all this these travel bans lift, you know I'm coming to Norway. Oh, I love it. Well, you have a place here. You have a place here for thank sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, remember to subscribe at your podcast platform of choice. If you're watching this on YouTube, that's where I hope you are. That's where the best thing is. Look how, pure, look how pretty we are. Uh, don't you guys love looking at us? And li- Yeah, there you go. Strike a pose. Uh, subscribe on your platform of choice. Uh, subscribe here on YouTube. If you're a first-time watcher, remember to click that little bell. Thank you so much for uh, listening and watching this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Bye, everybody.